Last week, I introduced you to Wells, which claims to be England's smallest city. I showed you its famous cathedral, and we learned about the interesting architecture and history. In this video, we'll go beyond the cathedral to explore some other lovely things to see in Wells. The day we visited Wells was very hot. In fact, the alleged hottest day on record in Britain. It was so hot, I had to pile my long mane of hair atop my head because it felt like wearing a wool scarf around my neck. It was so hot, this monk had to hike up his robes and plop down on the cool grass next to several kegs of cool water to survive. Now let's head back to the area around the cathedral to see interesting bits and bobs in the vicinity. Here is the gate entering into Cathedral Green, and check this out. This is Wells Cathedral School. Wouldn't that be a beautiful, castle-y looking place to go to school? In last week's video of Wells Cathedral, I showed you these stairs, which were used for centuries by church leaders walking up to the chapter house or choristers walking back and forth between the cathedral and the vicar's close across the street. This unique covered bridge, known as Chain Gate, was built in 1460 and connects the cathedral to the vicar's close with this nice walkway that protects from wind and cold. Vicar's Close is a very special place. Known to be the oldest residential street with original buildings still surviving in all of Europe. These amazing homes from the mid 14th century were constructed of mudstone from the English Midlands with the purpose of housing the members of the Vicar's Coral. There were originally about 20 houses on each side of the street, as well as the Vicar's Hall, Vicar's Chapel, and Library. Back in the 12th century, when the Vicar's Coral was established, the priests in it would chant the divine service in the cathedral eight times a day. Having their living quarters located here, adjacent to the cathedral, rather than scattered around town, helped to organize and ensure the future of the coral. The street itself is fascinating, being paved with rectangular quarried stones that were laid in an alternating pattern. The lane is about 140 meters long and cleverly tapered to be a few meters narrower at the far end, so that when viewed from the entrance near the chain gate, it has the optical illusion of appearing longer than it is. As you can see from this aerial view, the Bishop's Palace is a few steps away from the cathedral, as well as the square in the city center. It has been the residence of the Bishop of Bath and Wells for over 800 years. Construction on the palace began in the early 1200s by Bishop Jocelyn, who was also responsible for the building of Vickers Close. Over the next few hundred years, later bishops added the walls surrounding the property, as well as the chapel, the Great Hall, the Gatehouse, and the Moat. The grounds are most impressive. Throughout history, they have included a medieval deer park, streams, a reservoir, and a reflecting pond. Today, the current bishop still lives in a residence on site, but most of the palace is used for public functions and is open to the public as a tourist attraction. We didn't have time to take a full tour of the interior, but really enjoyed walking through the open areas that were free to visitors. I especially liked the moat and was fascinated by the swans, who once again proved to be most uncooperative. I sat for ages trying to get the perfect shot of a beautiful swan or two with their elegant necks shaped in a graceful hook or heart shape, but alas, these swans and cygnets just wanted to float around, preening, grooming, and awkwardly sticking their feet in the air. However, I did get a bit of footage of some cute tail wiggling, and I did get this swan to nicely pose for me for a moment, even though they were rather giving me a bit of disapproving side-eye glare. But they didn't attack me, so I considered that a win. I was hoping to see the swans at feeding time, which would have been great fun. Allegedly, they ring this bell here to indicate that they want to be fed. I did want to share this sign with you because, as we've discussed previously, people have a nasty habit of feeding bread to waterfowl and it is not good for them. Instead, you should be bringing seeds or greens to feed ducks, swans, or other waterfowl. 
Speaking of feeding, let's head over to see how the Loft Cathedral Cafe was and see what we had to eat for lunch. I'm having lunch with three blokes, so of course they sit in the brown chairs and I get the pink one. It was a charming little cafe and we enjoyed eating here. Here's a peek at the tasty food on offer. Cheese, scones, yes please. But Ian talked me out of the scones, so instead I chose the local cheddar and red onion chutney sandwiches and the local goat's cheese salad. And since I'm sharing those foods with Ian, I think I deserved a slice of this rhubarb and custard cake. I had rhubarb and custard ice cream as shown in my video of the Beamish. And much like the ice cream, this cake is rather magenta in color. I simply had to have it because, as Brits would say, it would be rude not to. Now let's have a wee wander around the Wells city center. Here is our cousin Mark explaining the two gates you can see from this viewpoint on the square. There are two gates. The left one is called Penniless Porch because it's where the, the beggars used to hang out. And that was built by Bishop Beckington. And the one on the right is to the Bishop's Palace. Here's a look inside the penniless porch, which has a lovely vault overhead. This is the area where the beggars would come to ask for alms. It was built in 1450 by Bishop Thomas Beckington, the bishop who was buried in the cadaver tomb shown in last week's cathedral video. And also he was responsible for building the chain gate to the vicar's close. This is the central area of Wells that is full of stalls on market day. And here, off the Market Square, is the lovely Town Hall. This is a public drinking fountain where they source the water from the wells, the springs nearby. You see these little gunnels here? When it's been pouring with rain, these run with water from the oh. wells. All the way through wells, there are little streams. Oh, wow. Between the roads and the pavement. Now let's look at a few other random things I saw while wandering the streets of Wells. These smoothies look good, and I loved the very appropriate name of this one. Look how clever they are in Wells. Here at the Butcher, they have these rotating butterflies that keep the flies from bothering the meat. And you know I'm gonna show you the magenta clothes in the charity shop and the magenta flowers in this little lane. And then this was another site I thought was rather interesting, a kind of pinkish building that is the old city jail. So we were planning to do some drone photography of Wells, but... Yeah. It started raining, raining so hard. it kind of ruined that. Yes, your wee drone has gone through quite a lot lately and we don't need yeah. it to be flying around in a thunderstorm. No. <laughs> Wells is home to an unusually large tithe barn, known as the Bishop's Barn. It is an ancient monument built of locally quarried stone in the 15th century. During the English Civil War, royalists were quartered in the barn, and in 1887, the Bishop of Wells donated the barn to the city. More recently, the barn has been a music venue and event center, hosting crowds of up to 1,500 people. Not your typical tithe barn, I'd say. If you come to Wells to see the cathedral, I highly recommend you take the time to stop by St. Cuthbert's Church as well. It is a gorgeous church full of interesting features that is well worth a visit. With its grand Somerset stone tower, it is often mistaken for the cathedral by new visitors to the city. This magnificent church is dedicated to St. Cuthbert, who was a monk, bishop, and hermit in Northumbria in the seventh century. After his death and burial in Durham Cathedral, St. Cuthbert became one of the most important medieval saints in the north of England, but it is not clear why this church should bear his name. There is, however, a tradition that the saint appeared in a dream to King Alfred whilst he was in Somerset. St. Cuthbert's Parish Church was built in the 13th century and renovated extensively in the 15th century in the perpendicular Gothic style. One thing that makes a big impression as soon as you look around the church is how colorful it is. The stained glass windows shine with brilliant colors, even on this rainy afternoon. 
and the beams in the 15th century angel roof overhead are covered in ornate carvings and detailed paintings in vivid colors. Absolutely stunning. Also, the floor is covered with beautiful Victorian tiles, adding another aspect of color and interest to the nave. The most mysterious surprise in the church was in 1848 when two medieval altar screens, or reredos, were discovered during renovation work. In the north transept are the remains of the 15th century reredos carved from bath stone. The original delicate carvings in the niches were covered in brightly colored paint and gold leaf. In the south transept is another large and very unique stone reredos. This one is from 1470 and represents the tree of Jesse, or the genealogy of Christ, with Jesse shown reclining here at the bottom. And here is the baptismal font, with its cover suspended in the air above it. This American flag caught my eye, of course. Apparently, it was gifted to the vicar by an American army colonel in 1944. This is a picture of the St. Cuthbert cross that was found in his grave in Durham. If you love cathedrals and if you are interested in St. Cuthbert, please watch my Durham Cathedral video here. Thanks so much for watching and do something good in the world today.